We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Black... Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bagani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsuna First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our second webinar in our public education series sponsored by UFA and RCF on farming in unfamiliar places. My name is Ellen Avinko, and I'm a policy analyst at the Simpson Center located at the School of Public Policy. And today's webinar features three speakers from across Canada working in academia as well as industry, um, all working on municipal food planning, uh, food systems and food accessibility uh, specific to cities in Canada and across Canada. So uh, before we start with our speakers, we're going to open with a poll question, uh, just a really quick way to see kind of um, the audience's thoughts to start. So the first question is, what is the most important factor for urban food systems in your opinion? So is it food availability and accessibility? emergency food and rations, prioritizing support of local farms, or ensuring price stability for goods. So I'll give everyone a minute to decide um, what they feel is the most important factor in urban food systems. Okay, so it seems that food availability and accessibility is the most popular vote. Um, there were a few votes as well for prioritizing support of local farms and ensuring price stability for goods. So some different thoughts and some different opinions. Um, but that leads us really well, actually perfectly, into our first speaker. So our first speaker is Barbara Swartzen Ruber. She is from Smart Cities Guelph, and she will be talking about circular food economy and introducing um, the idea to us. So take it away, Barbara. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just getting my slides up. There we go. I um, I want to tell you a, a story about some work that we're doing in uh, the city of Guelph and the county of Wellington, which are in Ontario. Uh, it's a mid-sized city of about 125,000 in the surrounding uh, county of uh, about the same size. And about three years ago, uh, no, sorry, about four years ago, we won Canada's Smart City Challenge. And the focus of our proposal was to create a circular regional food system. Sorry, I'm having trouble. There we go. And the reason why uh, we wanted to focus on this um, was because our linear food system is very much a contributor to GHGs, uh, greenhouse gases and to climate change. And food waste, cost Canadians, as probably many of you know, over 17 billion a year. And uh, in the future, our population is going to grow to approximately uh, 3 billion, 9 billion people actually, and already globally 3 billion are food insecure. The food system is also a major source of plastic waste among other things. So this is a linear system where we take things, uh, we make things, and then we use them and dispose of them. And it's incredibly wasteful. 
in a time when we need to be thinking about how do we address the big issues of climate change? How do we achieve the SDG goals? And we really think shifting to a circular food system has the power to reshape the world, to create uh, more thriving communities, to address ecological issues, and to address uh, the social injustices that we see in the food system. So what we've done in Guelph, Wellington, is to bring all of our community leaders together, folks that were working on uh, issues related to the environment, issues related to research into the food system, businesses, school boards, social innovators, and particularly because it's a smart city project, also technology and data experts. And we created this distributed leadership system where we're focusing on three big goals that I'll tell you about in a moment. But very much what we've done is try to turn the city of Guelph and the surrounding county of Wellington into an urban rural living lab where we can experiment, test, and learn on what it would take to change the food system to become more circular, resilient, and just. And so we've created an initiative called Our Food Future, which is uh, about how you intervene along every aspect of the food value chain uh, and to work in a very system focused way. And a, and a sister initiative, uh, something called the COIL, the Circular Opportunity Innovation Launchpad or COIL, which is really helping businesses, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, to make food businesses to make the shift to become more sustainable and circular and to come up with new uh, ideas on how we transform the food system. So this is a very uh, large diagram. And I just want to focus your attention on the four big bubbles in the middle. And they are our four goals, which are to create uh, increased access to affordable, nutritious food, to create more circular food businesses and collaborations, and to uh, not only reduce waste, but to see it as a resource and an opportunity that should be used. And then to obviously create system change. And then all of the bubbles you see around the outside are, are over 60 projects. Um, these are prototypes, pilots, demonstration projects that are underway in each of those aspects of the food system. And over the course of several years, we're starting to see uh, impacts from these projects. We're supporting farmers to use more regenerative practices. Uh, we're working with the emergency food system to uh, address issues of food access, uh, the tons of food that we have diverted from landfill, you can see here, and new products and services. So we're tracking very carefully the KPIs um, and the way in which we're having impact. So I'm just going to give you quick snapshots of some of the projects that we're doing under each of those three goals I talked about. And this is really interesting. This is um, a sand key diagram. Didn't know that that existed before this project, where we took 70 data sets and mapped the food waste and food flows across our county so that we could understand where the hot spots were and begin to intervene uh, and to address the food waste that was happening throughout our system. We did, uh, with public health, extensive work looking at our food environment and an assessment of where the issues were. We know that one in seven of our households uh, in the city and one in 10 in the county are food insecure. And uh, we identified where the neighborhoods are where there is a bigger issue in terms of access to healthy, affordable, nutritious food. Then we did a number of um, interventions. This is one of them. This is Groceries from the Seed, one of our social or uh, food security organizations. Uh, it's an online delivery service of uh, essentially what has been emergency food baskets. But in this case, you can pick and choose just like at a grocery store and have it delivered. And if I, as someone who isn't food insecure, pays full price for these um, groceries, that allows people to play, pay on a sliding scale lesser uh, costs in order to access food. So it's really moving the emergency food system to become more of a social enterprise and away from the charitable model. 
we had an urban agriculture challenge. We gave away 100,000 uh, to projects across the city and the county that were about increasing access through urban agriculture to healthy food. We have a guard, we supported a, a garden for newcomers where they are growing food from their home countries and able to uh, work and integrate together um, and to feel less isolated really uh, within our community. And that's a terrific uh, program that I, I know will continue to grow. I mentioned regenerative farming earlier. We have experimental acres pilot with some farmers who are, you know, just at the beginning of ready to take the risk around what would it look like if I turn some of my acres and use regenerative practices. And that's, uh, a, again, a program of work that we know uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest in and will continue to grow. Just going to touch on circular businesses and collaborations for a moment. I know that it's not the main focus of this webinar, but it's really important to involve the food business community and to if we're going to attempt to create any kind of um, systemic change within the food system. So we have programs uh, from incubators to acceler accelerators uh, to programs that are helping food businesses to upcycle and repurpose what they now are, you know, turning to landfill or uh, sending co to compost potentially can now become new uh, products and new lines of businesses for them. We have a social in, um, impact uh, program, finance program called Harvest Impact that helps deliver the financing, technical and social supports to food businesses and farmers who are undertaking the transition to uh, more circular principles and practices in their businesses. And waste as a resource, some of the work that we're doing here is incredibly interesting because it's taking products like, you know, the tops and bottoms of onion, onions that normally go to compost are now being made by company into onion liquid, which in, uh, in the past has had to have been imported and suddenly has become a tremendously lucrative uh, additional line of business for that company. But there are other uh, examples, including how uh, some of our businesses are working on single use take, uh, getting rid of single use takeout containers um, and have reusable containers. So these businesses are all working together in interesting ways. But what we're talking about today uh, is um, food hubs and uh, food policy councils. And we have started a food system work resiliency table, which is like a food policy council, functions like it, we think it will. It's very much grassroots. Uh, the members are deciding themselves the focus of the work. We think it will be one of the legacy projects. We're in conversations about, you know, does this evolve to become more formally attached as a food policy council to both the city and county? Very much so the group at the moment is focused on issues of equity and how we can address um, those issues within the food system and updating our uh, food charter. The municipality was one of the first uh, municipal established one of the first municipal food charters in Canada. So it, many years ago, so it certainly needs to be updated. We have a vision of the future over the next three years. We're working to create a food uh, security and health action plan with our local health system, the hospital system as well. We have a vision of all of the pieces that need to be in place from the local infrastructure, uh, the warehouse, the farmer's market, the transportation infrastructure for getting local food as well as emergency food. I, we don't think these should be separate pieces of infrastructure. How we integrate a funding strategy and also uh, how we uh, work uh, with our farmers to uh, develop a resilient um, and regenerative um, farming practices and food system. And it's really in many ways about building the local food movement, um, which this very much has become within our, our region and across Canada. There are currently uh, some, there is currently something called the Circular Cities and Regions Initiative where cities can join and develop circular strategies. Some of them are focused on food, some of them are focused on other sectors. So it's a growing municipal area of interest for sure. 
And with that, I will end and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that um, really interesting presentation. I studied in Guelph, so it's extra special to me to see how much um, how much engagement and how much is happening in the city on such an important topic. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone who's like watching and listening, um, Zoom does have a Q&A function. So if you have any questions or have any comments or want to go a little bit deeper on any of the topics, you can ask or um, post in the Q&A function in Zoom. And hopefully at the end of the presentations, we'll be able to go through some of the questions and have a little bit of a wrap up uh, discussion. Um, and before we move into our next speaker, we're going to do another poll. So um, the next poll is about the pandemic. So in considering a food systems approach, which um, Barbara kind of um, explained, um, what do you feel was impacted most by the pandemic? So was it food production and supply of agri-food products? Was it the processing facilities, the distribution channels, the retail sales and points of purchase, or perhaps it was something else? So I'll give a minute to participate in the poll and kind of see um, what our audience is thinking. Perfect. So it seems that distribution channels had a little bit of an edge over the processing facilities. I definitely think that issues with the supply chain became a really popular or a really prevalent topic uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, but there were as well some votes for food production and supply of agri-food products, as well as others. So perhaps our, our options weren't comprehensive enough. But with that question and uh, with our next speaker talking to John Bailey, he is the CEO of the Regina, uh, sorry, the Regina Food Bank, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, the food bank and uh, its function in the city. Thanks, everyone. Um, just just moving through, I just the the context of what we're talking about. I think we're I'm going to look to sort of speak to it on uh, a couple different levels. Um, one from the level of sort of a local. We'll call it service provider in that emergency food space, and then another as sort of a, a part and, and the chair of our, for lack of a better word, um, advocacy piece uh, that, that's sort of running through through the city uh, of Regina. So a couple of different lenses on sort of what the systems mean uh, for, for us here in a local context. So as we sort of talk about it, um, we are a small large city. So about 225,000 residents um, across sort of the the sort of metro area uh, makes us about the 18th biggest um, municipality in the country. So so not small, but but also not talking about the same um, size infrastructure as, as some of those major centers. Um, what's important to think about from a Regina context is we have an incredible depth uh, poverty and food insecurity. So if we look at sort of some of the numbers we see um, between of those 225,000 residents, between 35 to 44,000 of them are either acutely or chronically food insecure. Uh, and then and then with a with a sort of folks living in poverty uh, of about that same amount, sort of in that 35 to 40,000 folks living in, in, in poverty. So so a a big city with some some big city problems, but not necessarily uh, as many sort of larger city uh, resources to sort of address them, which is why organizations like a food bank um, sort of take on a little bit of an outsized role in some of those food systems and some of those food policy pieces. Um, I think context is really important um, as we sort of look at sort of the, the Western hemisphere, as we sort of go like the inflation sort of being driven by, by food costs. Uh, I know that wasn't the, the, the main answer uh, on the initial poll, but just there's a, it's a really important context piece. It's sort of um, food costs, uh, especially over the past sort of 18 months have really, really driven up um, both food insecurity, but also sort of concerns around food availability. So as we talk about supply chain and all that kind of stuff that we'll talk to later, it's important to remember that like 
as that sort of goes from an aggregate to sort of an individual level, um, the real impacts of sort of inflation are, are being hit. And, and again, as we look at sort of um, our our neck of the globe, um, we're, we're seeing that sort of proportional uh, driver of inflation um, basically on, on par with with a lot of parts of the world and, and, and less than, than others. Um, this slide is actually kind of a Rorschach test. Um, it sort of depends on if, how you feel of, about profit taking uh, versus other inflationary pressures. What this sort of shows is um, as a function of deconstructing sort of GDP, Canada is, is actually seeing gross operating surplus disproportionate, uh, and this is across all industries, disproportionate to sort of some of our, our, our comparables. So um, it's not the only thing that's driving it. If we look at sort of um, the latest food inflation, uh, inflationary pieces, I think uh, the inflationary rate on food for September of this year was a 10.3%, um, which would put us comparable to uh, other sort of largely um, agriculture driven countries. So, so that's not all that's driving it, but, but again, we cannot uh, discount the fact that there is some, some operating surplus and, and sort of profit taking that that's coming, coming apart uh, as, as a result of sort of in, in inflationary, inflationary pieces. Um, our food bank uh, is, is a, uh, is a fairly well-established food bank. Uh, we're coming up on 40 years in, in of, of incorporation. Um, we, last year we served, like actually between September and September of, of the previous year, 140,000 points of service, which are, which are basically client visits. Um, about 40% of those are kids, uh, about 11% are seniors. And, and during that time we distributed um, just shy of 4 million pounds of food. Um, that's all really important uh, to know uh, that, that our current context is we're serving more people than ever before, uh, which has led to a whole bunch of sort of food aspects and sort of food supply chain pieces that, that are changing. Um, the other sort of standout fact around this, I think uh, of note is as proportion, like the, the sort of demographic group across our city proportionally uh, of, of children, is about 20%. So, so in terms of disproportionate um, outcomes, 40% of the folks we serve are our kids, which is an overrepresentation of, of about 100%. So that is to say food insecurity, much like a lot of other social factors, um, a leading indicator and leading predictor of experiencing it as an adult is experienced as, as a child, um, which it paints a, a dire picture about what, about what that looks like. Um, I'll also say it's important to note that as a function of a, what was intended to be a temporary solution, um, at 40 years, uh, you're, you're no longer looking at temporary, you're looking at an institutional piece. So, so while I, while I echo the sentiment, um, that, that we should live in a society that doesn't need food banks, I think there's also a really important piece to consider that at 40 years, um, if we look at that as a half-life, and even if we start talking about policy changes, we're looking at 20 to 40 years before that impact uh, and that need is reduced down to an immaterial amount. Um, and that's if we start today. So, so I think that's a really important piece uh, as we sort of look at mm -hmm. social enterprise and all those types of things. They're incredibly important and have incredible sort of upside in terms of, of, of downstream impact. We, we cannot let that sort of perfect idea be the enemy of the good in that if not today where where folks getting their their food from as those policy changes as those opportunities mm -hmm. start to start to increase um which again sort of feeds into our guiding principles um our our role in this system is to feed the line meaning folks that are facing food insecurity today need food so we need to make sure we're getting uh food to folks uh where they need it when they need it today um, running concurrently with that is this idea of shortening the line. So making sure that we're providing empowerment pieces, we're providing access to resources that will allow for the acuity of food insecurity to shrink. So whether that be um, providing um, information on uh, financial planning, things like critical 
critical document procurement, making sure that folks have a birth certificate so can, they can start to access uh, support services, uh, information pieces on, on, on filing tax returns and all those types of things that, that folks don't necessarily have access to, but have a direct impact on, on food insecurity. And then ultimately to end the line. And, and making sure we're advocating for the policy changes that will that will end food insecurity, knowing that it's a it's a long arc of history, and and 40 years in, um, I would argue we're not a ton closer than we were uh, 40 years ago to to sort of ending the line. Um, so now the actual like topic of of conversation and sort of our role in in food systems. Uh, across across the city here. Um, when we look at our almost 4 million pounds of food, this is a rough breakdown. Um, and I think it's important to note that that sort of the, the pre-consumer reclamation, which is the big piece of the pie chart, and the post-consumer food reclamation um, is actually our part in, in waste reduction. So when you look at the billions of dollars that sort of food waste costs uh, us as, as, as a country and as a society, a lot of that is in addition to all this food being taken out of the system. So pre-consumer and post-consumer food reclamation is really all about um, taking food that would otherwise be go to the waste stream, perfectly edible, perfectly sort of, you'd be happy to put it on, on, your, on your table at home, but for various sort of um, business design, design reasons, uh, isn't, isn't able to be sold. We actually harvest that locally um, and make sure we get it out to folks uh, facing food insecurity uh, in our city. So, so when you look at the, when you look at sort of the composite of almost um, almost three million pounds of food every year, um, and that's just that's just sort of what we distribute. That doesn't count uh, towards what we take in, and then actually when we screen it, get rid of it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when it comes to uh, what we're doing around sort of circular uh, economy work. But but again, just so. People see where um, where the actual um, food waste and food waste versus food reclamation comes in. And again, I want to really stress that food waste is one thing; food reclamation is another. This is about taking food that would go to landfill, even though it's perfectly edible, and, and getting it into a system for folks who 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 can't necessarily uh, afford it. Um, our basic premise is there's enough food in the system to feed everyone. Um, it's a matter of allocation and distribution. Um, so when we look at our enablers around that, uh, we want to promote and invest in urban agriculture. So be that, uh, and for those of you who have, who have been out to Saskatchewan, our growing season is about four, maybe five months long. So when we talk urban agriculture, we're talking really quick turnarounds. We're talking uh, short growing seasons and, and getting out the door, or we're talking about moving it inside through vertical towers, through through work like that, which again have challenges at scale, but are able to sort of create um, a connection to food and potentially different uh, lines for food uh, that, that are possible. And again, it sort of takes some of the pressure off the conventional um, supply chain if we can sort of get that going to scale. So that's what we're working through. So again, like I said, whether it's a park pocket garden in, in somebody's yard to uh, garden towers that are sort of done in sea cans or in classrooms or in, in dedicated indoor space to, to take our growing season from about five months uh, to 12 months to, to try and um, push that out. That's an, that's an incredibly important part of what we do. Um, we've taken steps to sort of control our supply chain. Um, as we as we entered the pandemic, uh, and 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 I think rightly noted in that last poll, um, supply chain is a huge issue. Um, we consistently get uh, orders sort of accepted and then turned back or not accepted uh, at all. I would sort of say, in our our sort of unfulfilled orders uh, with major wholesalers, is in the millions of dollars annually. Um, so what we realized we had to do was start controlling our own supply chain. So uh, with that, making sure that we look at direct producer relationships to start um, procuring and having supply to draw on and having it packaged locally. So uh, a sub a sub target of this is to have 25% of all food we distribute grown locally. 
Um, and, and we want to make sure that's everything that we can supply around uh, vegetables when they're seasoned, grains and ingredients uh, year round, and, and, and again, sort of proteins and, and dairy, dairy as we can get it to make sure that we actually own and white label the means of production to make sure that we're, we're handling that. And then, and then, and then, as I mentioned earlier, our place in the circular economy, we have a, we have an MOU in place um, to, to actually turn our food waste, which again is sort of a step removed from, from sort of the, the commercial food waste into uh, both, both um, really significant amounts of uh, feedstock, which again, we can then turn into social enterprise and, and resell to folks and, and actually uh basically chemical free fertilizer uh, for growing seasons, which again can become uh, both an enabler of our, our urban agriculture or also a, a line of, of, of sort of social development and, and, and social enterprise as we sort of move through. So that's what the food bank does. Uh, what we're doing as a city is, is establishing a food council. Uh, it's a community action uh, table around food insecurity and, and these are priorities. So making sure basic foods are met um, making sure that we're addressing food security, uh, not just food insecurity, um, making sure we're strengthening the food systems uh, and, and making sure we have uh, a diversity available to, to everyone in the city, uh, access to food and water uh, for all residents, uh, dealing with food availability. Um, and food availability is, if we look at our city, we have a number of uh, sort of food deserts where there's no grocery store within walking distance or easy uh, public transportation distance, uh, which means uh, convenience stores uh, become uh, sort of the, the grocery store of, of the area, which is not great when we're talking about fresh, healthy, vibrant food. It leads to a lot of processed food. It leads to a lot of, of sort of um, the stuff you'd get at a, for example, a 7-Eleven, not to, not to call anything out, but that's sort of what food is to, to a lot of residents of our city who can't get around. And, and again, developing opportunities for urban agriculture, be it on a larger scale at uh, city-driven facilities for plots of lands that, that, that they can then irrigate or, or move through. Uh, and again, all in this idea of sort of going like, we need to make sure we're addressing uh, the needs. Um, what you'll notice is missing from this municipal response is advocacy pieces. Um, which is a little bit challenging uh, as we sort of go through and around availability because there's lots of agriculture policy. There's lots of there's lots of policies around, but when we talk about food insecurity and getting food to folks, there's very little policy to actually uh, benchmark to uh, or or to work through. So so when we talk about um, even something as inherent as sort of the right to food, well, the right to food uh, in a Canadian context. Um, as a, a formal right, doesn't really exist. It's a, it's a, it's what we all aspire. I don't think there's anybody who disagree with it. But if you sort of point to like, okay, so where does that exist in a charter or in a policy? Uh, you'll be hard pressed, pressed in most municipalities to actually see at a provincial or municipal or federal level where that exists. And that's something we need to work on, sort of going. So when we talk policy, it's about uh, living wage, or uh, we're talking about subsidized childcare, we're talking about all these sort of enablers to allow people to actually gain the income to move uh, outside of food insecurity. Those policies are not actually about, about the food end of, end of things. Um, and here's our, our actual work priorities. Um, we're trying to drive a system-wide approach to food reclamation. As we sort of went through and did consultations, uh, one of the things we found was that um, we had scarcity driving scarcity uh, amongst agencies in our, in our city, meaning um, if there was an availability and the example I always use is like, if there are six bags of oranges uh, and an organization can only get five out the door, um, they were gonna take all six and then turn the other one into waste. What we're trying to do is create a situation where the means and the inputs um, actually become centralized uh, along with distribution to make sure that if you're an organization that can use um, five bags of oranges, that additional bag that we have sitting around uh, can go to another organization that can use it and make that the actual role uh, of, of that municipal, municipal led organization, as opposed to making it on uh, another organization, uh, uh, the receiving organization and, and having that be a capacity drain. Because quite frankly, we know 
is not going to happen. Um, another piece that we're working on is actually self-advocacy around folks facing food insecurity. Uh, we know that there is a incredible um, cross-section of our community of folks facing food insecurity, um, in large part outside of sort of connection to local agencies and CBOs, they don't have a voice. So, so we're trying to create a situation where, where the actual voice of, of, of folks facing food insecurity are heard, um, not only for the present, but also for the future, sort of uh, making sure that any interventions we sort of come up from the policy perspective actually have the effect of rising people out of it so that once people sort of graduate out of uh, chronic food insecurity or out of acute food insecurity, we can also connect with those folks and make sure that 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 their their voices is being heard, and 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 create a common set of language around around these food systems. So if if you have an an emergency piece around um, a meal, well, in our in our city, a, a quick poll: if there's 50 organizations doing food insecurity work, there are 50 or even more than 50 because some have subsets versions of what a meal is. Uh, so it becomes really hard to, to judge uh, the, the, um, the apples to apples version of, of what everyone is kind of talking about. So, so that's sort of what we worked on uh, and are working on from a priority lens and, and making sure we're, we're going that, that route. And then with that sort of establishing sort of what the connection is to um, local infrastructure around um, processing, because again, we're an ingredients uh, province, we're an ingredients municipality. How do we sort of parlay that into uh, food, not only for at the consumer level, but also at the at the folks that that by nature of of their their situation are actually excluded temporarily or on an ongoing basis from sort of uh, consumer level acquisition of food. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and we'll, I'll, I'll pass it over. Thank you so much, John. That was so informative. I don't think that um, food banks were something that I maybe, you know, being naive would have thought of when it comes to circular economies and kind of food economies. But um, the food reclamation is definitely a very important point um, that I don't think I would have thought of before. So we'll go straight into um, our next speaker. So that's uh, Laurette Dupe. She's a professor at McGill University, and she's also the founding chair and scientific director of the McGill Center for the Convergence of Healthcare and Economics. And uh, we'll pass it over to Lorette. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, so I, am, I will emphasize uh, my presentation on my role as a, a, a co-PI of a, a three council funding we got uh, with the PI being, the nominated PI being from Guam, uh, for uh, being uh, the training platform for the LTCT initiative across Canada. And uh, we uh, have been um, uh, being selected uh, for two reasons, I think, is that LTCT is not just a matter of public health or population health and healthcare. It is a matter of the whole of society, as Barbara and John had so well explained, uh, the city is essentially uh, food is the, can be the entry point for creating a context where everyone can strive uh, uh, and uh, can try, not strive, uh, whether at the individual or at the enterprise level and so on. And uh, we build also the second reason is that uh, we uh, build upon uh, existing investment that we have already made in Canada, Barbara has been talking about the 10 millions that Guelph has had uh, won uh, in one of the category of, an, of the uh, infrastructure Canada. Uh, Montreal had one in the other one with the 50 millions, but very much the two of them having uh, the same approach of uh, taking food as entry point. Uh, and the second part, 
that is to see, and that's the smart aspects, to what extent uh, can there be building upon the data, the digital, and all the capacity we have now uh, for uh, accelerating these transformations. So what you have here is the diagram that uh, we, uh, we that was at the, that is at the core of our food uh, smart city, where you have uh, individual nested within uh, the neighborhood, the city, the region, and so on, uh, and to see to what extent concretely those specific projects and those everyday life can be supported as effectively as possible as we move forward. And here, uh, this is uh, and this approach, which we call convergence by design, uh, that there is a whole network worldwide that has been working at this for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, but that there is uh, some convergence here is that beyond the food entry point to LTCT, LTCT it can be also entry point for a healthy world. So those diagrams here just illustrate that uh, how we can work very pragmatically along the line of what Barbara and John were talking about and see to what extent uh, we can accelerate uh, the, the transformation, both on the food innovation, on the diet, and also on the food system side. And here, uh, the, this uh, uh, slide here is more or less the same thing with two, uh, two difference, uh, two addition. You see here this whole person, this diagram to the right, uh, is uh, the diagram of WHO about the quote-unquote social determinants. And I want to make the point that the whole person is the citizen, it's the farmer, it's the consumer, it's the patient, and so on. And if you look at what is around here, uh, it is essentially each sector that needs to work together. And can we really uh, support uh, the type of approach that John and Barbara uh, were talking about. And uh, we claim that uh, it may be a point uh, in our revolution of mankind that uh, if we work and embrace some of this complexity uh, within the context, the diagram that you see here um, is from a nature paper, uh, that was called measuring algorithm, algorithmically infused society. So the point is that we maybe with action leader like Barbara and John and with um, both uh, academic and uh, uh, action leader in the context of data science and artificial intelligence, we can uh, we can accelerate this transformation that we want. So here, uh, this is, uh, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a PNES paper about more, uh, 10 years ago now that illustrated our approach. A person in system to adaptive real world behavior and real world context in the whole of society paradigm. paradigm. And in fact, the work that we are doing with uh, taking Guelph and Montreal as kind of action partner and test bed, but moving forward also uh, at, uh, uh, at looking if you take uh, grain or if you take, there is a whole provincial and national and global supply chain and ecosystem to impact also. So here, uh, just a few slides of the uh, my individual here uh, in the middle. I come from 30 years ago, training of behavioral economics when it was starting. Um, and uh, it's really, it's not just looking at um, uh, individual uh, as being either completely rational or completely um, completely irrational. The point here is that we do need in food system transformation within each of this, they have individual, whether these individuals are producer, policy maker, and so on. So that's one of the core parts of what we are bringing to this uh, to this approach of convergence. The second one here is that 
if we look whether we are poor or rich, uh, food is primarily eaten uh, for, uh, for what it does to you, whether it is the basic needs or the taste and so on. And what you see the flower to the left is that how can we innovate that it is really, and it applies for the, uh, uh, John was calling this, uh, uh, re, uh, re, um, uh, the, the reprocess, uh, re treatment of the original is that whatever we invite people to eat uh, should be at this convergence. Uh, what one will want, what is, what, uh, what is needed, what someone is willing to pay, what the planet can sustain, and uh, what the, the the whole system is willing uh, and able to um, uh, uh, to produce, and that brings here uh, the need to bring not only multi jurisdiction and so on, but many disciplines together and many sectors, and to what extent uh, we can make it uh, the. the I'm saying, I'm not embracing all of that complexity, but some of it. And that is why over the years, we have been coming up with this idea of thinking, could we kind of see, uh, can there be a common pool of capability between the, municip the community, the municipal, federal, provincial, or whatever, but also common pool of capability uh, between uh, what is created by the various actors and see to what extent then project by projects, we are supporting in a way that uh, all together though those, those projects support system level transformation. And here uh, in the context of uh, um, circular economy and SDG, uh, I think Barbara was talking very well about the KPI, how they are important, but the KPI needs to be nested a bit into each other. And that's why among the projects that we are involved, that uh, Canada is in the process of creating a national sustainability index for the agri-food sector, but those, uh, the cascading down and up is extremely important to be uh, having uh, the appropriate uh, way of supporting uh, the enterprise, the sector, the institution, and policy, and so on. So this is why uh, over the last uh, 15, 20 years, in fact, those convergence platform, I won't uh, get into the detail here, uh, but that's really to see, could we walk any entry point where there is a coalition of the willing and there are initial, in, uh, important and interesting happening, to what extent can this be supported by this combination of capability, a digital backbone, a good contact, a good understanding and data uh, driven understanding of behavior in context and also the human backbone that is whether it is the human as uh, uh, in the organization of catalysts like Barbara and John uh, who are making things happen. And here the, the, uh, the point that I want to make also is that uh, those system level transformation uh, they are an evolutionary reconfiguration of what uh, both of what we do and what support what we do in society. But there are currently in the science of complexity, the science of data, to a way to kind of link this with concrete use cases and see how we can advance and uh, support the use case as being as they are being deployed, but learning as we go forward and connecting so that uh, it is really uh, the uh, the um, uh, organizing uh, those data, those algorithms, and so on, so that we uh, we kind of uh, uh, organize what is produced in the bottom up approach. At the same time that we can uh, also uh, kind of being able to inform and guide what is done uh, at the at the policy level uh, or, uh, or at, uh, across various jurisdictions. So here, I think I will skip this one. Uh, just uh, here, this is that gives kind of a, 
an illustration of what I was talking about, more interaction between the research and the action, but you also have this uh, synthetic uh, digital backbone, the decision support, and the data portal. I will uh, walk you very briefly. I won't stop on the uh, on uh, on each slide, but essentially, uh, uh, creating. We have taken Montreal for a good number of years now uh, for developing this approach of synthetic population and synthetic ecosystem where uh, you can uh, geo-reference uh, various layers here, uh, for instance, here zooming on neighborhood and community, uh, where uh, you can get uh, where are fresh food, uh, where are the community organization, and so on and so forth. But underlying this, there is a synthetic population that is based on also geo-reference census data, so that there is, it's not just mapping on the map, it's, uh, uh, it is also to be able to start creating real-time evidence that support uh, the innovation and support also the monitoring of the impact. Uh, here, uh, overview the food environment in Montreal, uh, the number of, uh, number of organization that uh, number of access point uh, that are uh, that are in the various neighborhood uh, here the uh, uh, classification of the food environment uh, as a function of various uh, characteristic of the of the area uh, under the uh, looking at the demographic and food environment uh, classification so this is the type of uh, the type of, of uh, ex existing and next generation tool that could allow us like here. Uh, in uh, uh, this is uh, Montreal as uh, a policy council, but there's also uh, they are also having various uh, tables de quartier, which are uh, so here we are working with also some specific use case there to start uh, really documenting and working and creating this data ecosystem. Here uh, is the mapping of the. Um, uh, of the, the stakeholder in the area that I was just talking to you. And the other point also, and uh, when John was talking about the challenge of logistics and so on, it is it is key of looking at all the all the pieces together from the from the uh, uh, community level of uh, ecosystem of food, but it's also the same food the same grain that is produced uh, for local, uh, it is operating into an, a full, a full value chain and market that include uh, the, uh, the provincial, national, and global, and so on. So that kind of uh, two complementary uh, entry point in the system transformation, in the transformation is important to us. Uh, so that's my last diagram here about kind of the uh, the uh, architecture that we have, it's, all, it's not all of it at all operational, but mo movement have been done and are being done uh, that are, whether it's uh, Regina or whether it is Amsterdam in the Netherlands and so on, there is really a cross fertilization that, uh, that is important to, that, and that we can make if we uh, look at this ecosystem where the data data that are trusted and agile um, can be a, a core catalyst for system level transformation. And uh, I will end here. Um, we are having, I will do my quick uh, promo and closing. Uh, we are having in Ottawa, um, uh, November 17 and 18, uh, the first annual meeting of the Smart ATCT training platform. And I would, uh, strongly encourage uh, 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 people in this audience to be to join us for this. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, <clears throat> uh, Lorette. That was a really great presentation, and I really enjoyed that you were able to go so in depth and really relate it back to um, Montreal, but also how it applies to the Regina Food Bank as well as the Guelph, uh, the circular food economy. I am looking at the time and I'm seeing that we don't have very much time left, 
But just um, just a minute, if uh, the other speakers want to join as well, I'm just wondering if you could just give like a one, like one or two lines, basically talking about the importance of cooperation with whether it's your local government or with the provincial government or maybe even the federal government. Uh, what is the different roles of, uh, or what are the roles, the most important roles in terms of uh, collaboration with government? So maybe Lorette, if you want to start. Okay, I think that the collaboration with government uh, uh, of of the various actors, including academia, is very uh, very important. But one of the key point is that whenever we collaborate or ask someone to collaborate. Uh, everyone has has uh, his or her day job, <laughs> and that is why I would say uh, the government can serve as catalyst for making things happen, uh, set policy context, uh, mm -hmm. invest in uh, they they invested in bridge, they may invest in data now, um, but that's really um, uh, this notion of. Uh, 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 I think uh, John was having this concept of self-agency or self-something. Mm. Uh, it's not either me or government or whatever. I think that this notion of, uh, this, that, that's what I call this whole of society, starting with the individual is a key part to move forward. For sure. Barbara or John? Um, well, I'll jump in and say, you know, we really couldn't do our project if it wasn't a collaboration of many actors. I do think that the city or the local government, municipal government does play a key role. I think it's a new line of business for them that they're not entirely um, used to at the moment, but um, beginning to see the tremendous power and opportunity that there is in um, working uh, shoulder to shoulder with the community to ensure that the food system is accessible, equitable, and uh, leads to healthy outcomes, and also um, increases economic opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. And I think I just I take on to what 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 both of the comments before were, but also in that it's important. Also remember that like all levels of government are really bad at collaboration. <laughs> like they they sure. <laughs> they they don't. It's just it's just the nature of it. So I think as we sort of go through and like shared visions, shared um, goals, uh, shared understanding of impact, knowing that. It's it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a collaboration because because governments just aren't good at it. They want to be. I think their hearts in the right place, but when it comes down to it, it's bureaucracy for a reason. Um, and and just know that going in. Yeah, as a that's long a, time a great point. Government, as a as a long time uh, government um, employee at the provincial and municipal level, I entirely agree with you, John. It's very. <laughs> It's very hard to um, work in a in a collaborative way, but it's entirely possible, which is really Absolutely. the wonderful thing I I enjoy about this project. Thank yeah, you. that's why I was hoping you would say, Barbara, because <laughs> we are all saying that's bad. Government don't collaborate. Where are we going? Whereas there are there are ways to do it. One pe boiling the ocean one one drop at a time, and I think. That's <laughs> So important to to build upon whether it's Guelph, Montreal, whatever, uh, or other projects where it's at a level. But I think it is possible. But this coalition of the willing and the, the transformation, once you start entering the system, uh, you can get system level change in some way. So don't be depressed, John. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Okay, well, I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing that we are coming to the end of our, our webinar time. I want to thank all the speakers once again. Thank you so much for participating and really sparking this great discussion and offering all these different perspectives and viewpoints again from all across Canada. And um, so I just want to thank you again. And we hope that um, you, as well as our participants as well, join our next webinar that'll be in November. Uh, it's gonna be on the frozen north. We have two speakers, uh, one from the University of Calgary, 
who is working on innovative food systems in northern indigenous communities, as well as um, the uh, another speaker who is a coordinator at the Inuvik um, Community Greenhouse and grows fresh produce in uh, northern Canada. So we're really excited about that as well. And thank you again. And we hope that uh, you join us again soon. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.